Hello everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to start. It is 1.30. I'm Clément Marcelot. I am a senior solution engineer at BitSight. I work mainly in France and today's topic Today's topic is NIS2, and the presentation is going to last about 25 to 30 minutes. We'll actually try to keep some time for questions. So the subject is NIS2. Uh, it's not BitSight. We'll talk about it briefly uh, last five minutes, but the main objective is uh, NIS2. So we will not have time to get into details of the directive, but it is going to be focused on the main um the main aspects of NIS2. So a little uh, disclaimer, I am not a lawyer, I am not a legal representative, and so what I'm going to bring today is a technical and operational out, um, outlook, but it's not legal. It is an important topic, however, um, yes, I am just here to be very clear that I am not a legal representative. So before we get into the subject, so you might see the screen is rather small, but um, the two main areas where you can get some information is the official website on the European Parliament where you can consult the uh, entire text and also the ANSSI website because we will have a main role in France about NIS2. I encourage any one of you that have interests, and if you haven't done so, to read the directive. It is rather easy to read. A good idea is to start from the end, because in the beginning of that text you have 144 um, pretexts, so it's maybe a little bit funny, but it is interesting to start from the bottom down. On this slide, a few examples that we hear commonly is the regulation, the directives, there's two of them from our point of view that are actually talked about a lot is uh, DORA and also CRAC, which is not in the list on the screen, but um, yes. So the subject is NIS2. We have the same objectives. It's a different uh, scope, but in terms of um, entities that are concerned, uh, we still talk about NIS2. So I'm going to give you a little bit of context on an NIS2. There's a regulation already in place that is called NIS1. It is pertaining to a few entities. It's about 300 uh, companies in France. It's a bit similar to implications like LPM, which is has its main idea to have uh, entities that are essential to economy and the budget that have a systemic uh, outlook and to reinforce cybersecurity in those entities. So the idea of NIS2 is not only this, but it's also because of COVID. We have identified that there were more essential entities than what we thought prior. Uh, if you talk about a whole country's management or region, when you talk about like confinement, you could see that there were some areas of the economy that were on standby. And from there, we were able to determine different areas and different topics. So NIS2 is to add more entities that were already in NIS1 and also to introduce new aspects in terms of obligations and what is uh, mandatory. So the calendar, we have it here. 
and that's also why we talk about NIS2. It's because it's been a while that the directive has been worked on, it's been voted, but it will be implemented starting the 18th of October. It is a directive, it's not a regulation. DOOR is a regulation. Uh, you can um, apply it to each state members of the European Union. But it is not the case for NIS2. Because it is a directive, it implies that different state members, through the regulation, um, the state member needs to create a transposition in order to have it implemented with all the specifics within the legal uh, framework. So this is going to be on the 17th of October. And until then, that is when the transposition work is being um, worked on. And now we need to work on the details. So today we talk about NIS2, I mean today in this conference, and some details are not yet decided because we still need to figure out how to transpose those. And after this, the calendar will have to have the next day the implementation. So October 17th and then implement. Um, implementation on the 18th. So we know there's going to be a little gap in between the writing of the text and the implementation of this text. So whatever happens, it will be on the 18th of October. The also 17th of April 2025 is an important date. That will be when you will have the final list. But it does not mean who will be in that list. It means that in the text, it is planned to have a certain number of criteria to identify the elements that need to be in NIS2, but the text um, plans on having each local regulator implemented in this new text because it will be judged as essential for the country or the region. So finally, we know that 95% of the uh, actors will be already decided, but we have until the 25th of April. I'm sorry, uh, 17th of April, 2025. 20, so what changes? I was talking about it earlier, so it's going to be a broader span. I'm going to read it again. I know it's a bit small. In NIS1, there were a few numbers of entities that were identified in terms of industry and sector, energy, bank, uh, transportation, uh, drinking water, uh, digital infrastructure. Yes, so these areas are considered as being essential. And added to this, also as essential, is space, public administration, and then uh, used water treatment and Yes, we noticed during COVID that that was also very important. And then we'll find the important entities, so you will see the difference in between those two, and that will reside in the control and penalties. So you'll find digital providers, uh, electricity um, pro providers in terms of manufacturing. So you'll see that there will be articles that identify very precisely those different with subcategories in terms of transportation. You, We see that it's train, uh, water, uh, flying, all of those subcategories are identified as well. We'll find also the chemical industry, the um, uh, agriculture. I also work in a company that does not Um, mail, mail transportation, and also handling um, garbage. So this is kind of a like really wide area, and it's within Europe, 150,000 companies in Europe that are qualified for all of these criteria. So we see it's broader than NIS-1. That was 300 companies. So we have this qualification in terms of um, area. We have something that is called the cap size. 
in terms of size depends on the number of persons, of individuals, and also revenue. So if you're in the financial sector, but you have NCI of three people, you will not be um, concerned by NIS2. So we need to have a certain size of companies in order to qualify, and you can find all of this in the documentation that is available on the website, because we know that until October, there's gone, there has been already quite a bit of um, communication about this. So we can see that we can reside in a sector that has uh, some essential um, criteria, but you can be in between two criteria. So you have 250 people for essential uh, sector, and you can also have a mix of both. So you can – so what changes in terms of span? We see that the content is different in terms of uh, obligations, so we will find some different focuses. So we will see incident reporting. We will ask those entities to give some feedback about those within the 21st, I'm sorry, 24 hours. I've, ha I've had an incident, and if it's not been qualified yet, you still have until 72 hours in order to give a more detailed report with um more precise, you know, information about the impact or what type of incident. And then you have one month to transmit the full report with the analysis of the incident and all of its consequences. So this is the first point. It's going to be a challenge. We know about this, especially for the entities that are smaller with a smaller uh, cyber maturity. So this will be a rather complicated element. And another element that is not that typical, but it's the responsibility. NIS2 uh, mentions, um, I'm not going to go into specifics, but mentions the um, management of all concerned entities is responsible. So that means that individuals are legally responsible for the implementation of the of the NIS2. And in terms of penalties, they can actually impact the individuals. So you can be forbidden to work as a manager temporarily, so this is um, something that actually exists. So obviously it can be uh, bothering, and I know that it would probably be an important part in terms of awareness because, I mean, we can say it in some way that, yes, the individual will be um, given responsibility and not just to a moral person but a physical person. But penalties is a different aspect. NIS2 introduces penalties, which is different from DORA because here, if I'm an essential entity, in case of unconformity, it can be 10 million euros or 2% of the revenue, global group revenue and penalty. It depends which one is higher. So if 2% is 150 million, then this will be the penalty. But it can be up to this much. So yes, it, it's kind of similar to a GDPR uh, penalty. It's not the same approach at all, but in terms of penalty, it's the same thing. But if I'm an important, uh, it's going to be 7 million or 4%. And it can also be the potential suspension of uh, those and also temporary um, impeachment to have a management uh, position. And in BitSight, we are uh, tackling NIS2 a lot, is the focus on the supply chain. The supply chain, we talk a lot about about it in the text. It's an uh, element that is being taken into consideration by the regulators. 
but he has a certain number of um, missions like assessment, uh, risk evaluation, but it's a very important focus. We ask the companies to take into consideration the risk of the supply chain and have a policy and um, management of this. Responsibility, the management responsibility. I talk about it, I think, um, quite a bit, so I'm not going to be more into details. I was looking for the quote, but I can't find it. Another point are controls. So, of course, the idea is how the reg local regulars will control the companies, important entities, main entities, and how, in what way they are compliant. It is detailed into two articles, 32 and 33, which are pretty much the same, just one for essential entities and the other one for important entities. It is one of the uh, difference between important and essential. There is more control on essential than important, and especially for essential. Controls are proactive, ongoing, and random. While if I am an important entity and not essential, controls will be exposed. So if there is an incident, a security incident, for example, this is where it's not that clear, or if there is a suspicion of non-compliance. So how would it translate? How can this suspicion can be implemented? Is it an indication? I don't know. I can't answer to you. Sorry. I don't see the answer in the text. But in practice, it is especially essential entities that will be controlled beforehand and not just in reaction. From the control itself, once again, we are expecting on the local level translation to have more detail at the technical level to see how this control will be implemented. We have two aspects to be more clear. The regular can delegate this mission to organisms that will be accredited. It seems logical, of course, 15,000 companies in France, we can, of course, think that would be a lot for uh, Denis uh, to have control on all this society beyond uh, its uh, usual uh, mission. So, yeah, of course, it is the uh, ANSI that we choose. So probably they will use a third part, uh, third part companies to, for these controls. Another aspect to be more clear is uh, the technical aspect of the control. We have the broad lines of the toolbox of the regular it is described saying it's a third part a security control that being implemented in every company, so it will be controlled on site, remote. It will take a lot of time, of course. We will also see also security scans. It is clearly defined. They have to be a descriptive, non-discriminatory, fair and transparent. Also, some demands in terms of uh, information, so when they will have to check the existence and the implementation of uh, security policy, for example. So the idea is to uh, communicate and collaborate with this company to take these uh, elements and ex examine them and review them. Same way we send a form to a uh, provider, we examine the uh, provided element. They ask for proof, of course. Maybe we'll also use some kind of a certification. It is a whole set of indicators and elements that will be used by the uh, regulator or controller to be sure that everything is compliant. Regarding the toolbox, it's the same one for an essential than for an important entity. It's in, within the execution that it is different. Obligations. A big part, so that's why I kept it for the end. So, once again, it is a non-exhaustive uh, slide. We have more details within the directive. We have several obligations. So, of course, it is an important for, uh, aspect for uh, the uh, report in terms of risks and incidents. Also, the supply chain, the analysis and risk management of the supply chain. I need to have a process, different tools, a policy of the review of my supply chain, so it means a lot of things. Beyond the supply chain, we also have the uh, risk analysis and management, like in any quantity. So it's not just security, 
it's also uh, risk related. So it's complicated. It's complicated to uh, have this uh, risk management, but it's better than uh, crisis management. Another topic, because in the text it is considered as a different topic, control, control of these uh, risk management policies. So you don't just need to have a document describing the different uh, process of this uh, risk management, the different tools, etc. You have to assess yourself or uh, through a third part to be sure that these controls are powerful, are useful, with a continuous monitoring of all this uh, risk policy management. Another aspect is the continuity of uh, activities. It is a topic that we are very familiar with through different texts and regulations, but the idea is to have a, a real plan of ongoing activity. Cyber hygiene. It is as we saw it in the um, text, so we expect from these companies to adopt the good practices in terms of cybersecurity on several elements that we consider, well, in my opinion, as obvious. KPA, when it's necessary to be clean, cryptographic controls. So it covers a, a whole uh, lot of topics. Authentication, it is a separate topic, but of course it's also known this uh, cyber hygiene. So we expect these entities to implement a strong authentity, authentication with several factors, ongoing uh, authentication. Also using uh, more secured uh, communication systems, can be through emails, any, any other communication. Also, the uh, asset and vulnerability management. So we need to have a process and, and tools to assess and manage the security of these tools and to know every, very well these assets. I need to know my hardware, my software, what I am being exposing, the internal, external aspect, and I have to manage it and to master it. If you don't know, it's not because you, if you don't know that your assets are being exposed or they belong to the company, it won't be an excuse. Another important topic, training of the users. So more specifically, when we talk about the uh, responsibility and accountability of the directors, within the directors, you can see that the management have to be trained in cybersecurity. So once again, we don't have a lot of uh, details in terms of training, what they are expecting, a boot camp of two weeks or a webinar of one hour, we don't know. I guess we'll see later. The manager have to be trained in cybersecurity, and the directive doesn't stipulate it as mandatory, but strongly recommend for this training be ongoing and continuous for the whole users of the different systems, which of course seems obvious when we think in terms of risks. We know that the human factor is essential and that it is one of the most uh, difficult uh, topic to address because we it's not enough to implement a tool. It is an ongoing effort, so we have it is clearly identified within the directive. Small focus on the supply chain, and then I think I take a break for your questions. So f supply chain. For a bit side, it is an important aspect for us. We have three main elements three aspects of this uh, uh, directive on the supply chain. The one which is more important for the companies is the one on the right. It's the uh, risk assessment with your suppliers. There are also others aspect. The regulator will have missions in collaboration with the uh, ones of the different member states on a more systemic uh, uh, supply chain uh, risk assessment. And we have an example in the directive that was taken for the 5G. So the 5G toolbox is mentioned. So once you have this uh, assessment, the idea is to see if we have a technology of a provider that represents a systemic risk for the whole EU, and to do it on a more operational uh, way. We have several elements about the collaboration within the member states, because it is one of the objectives of uh, NIS2. Well, 
when you get back on this, the objective of the INI is to, is to harmonize and streamline the maturity levels of uh, cybersecurity within the member states. Within the different uh, industries, we don't have the same maturity in the different industries, but also from one country to another. So the idea is to streamline and harmonize everything and reinforce collaboration between the different member states. So a small recap about the essential elements. And I do realize that it's uh, very small. You cannot read it. But if we should... Uh, a bit recap. So NIS2 big changes compared to NSI1 is the scope, a brighter scope, a lot more identities, a lot more industries, 150,000 organizations in Europe, 15,000 in France, and there will be the possibility to increase more entities, maybe not 3,000, but they will have the possibility to increase uh, this uh, figure, depending on criteria this notion of essential entities and important entities. Not a big difference in just for uh, the uh, controls and accountability. Focus on incident reports on supply chain and the penalties. I'll stop here. If you have any question, maybe, if not, I have more content, more on the uh, bit side aspect. I would like to take more time for your questions if you do have some. Yes, one mic is coming for you. Good afternoon, I'm um, uh, from Actions, Gunay Bennett. I had a question coming back on the control. You say that the audit of security should be done, uh, at least for, for the proof, from a qualified uh, audit. So uh, is it mandatory for this uh, regulator for the, to be uh, Qualified where well, we are waiting on the uh, local uh, translation. They will have up to the uh, October 17th to uh, provide these details and to see how we will implement these controls. It's not mentioned in the directive. I can't remember, but I know that there are some recommendations, some guidelines in terms of what we can say as being a uh, qualified audit. But until now, it's not uh, established yet. Good afternoon, Benedicta from Ori uh, Society. Uh, regarding the criteria that you mentioned, how can we know if we are important and essential? You mentioned the number of employees and the uh, revenue. These two criteria have to uh, be more than 250 uh, people and more than 2 million euros of your revenue. Do you know if we have to take into account two aspects or just one? I think that it's the two, if I remember well, but to be honest, I doubt. I can't remember. I think that it is, but I should check. Sorry. There is someone in the back that have a question. Nathalie Louis from Archer Inc. Consulting. I would like to come back on the accountability, the increased responsibility for management. I would like to know if uh, NIS2 also explains if it, we have a higher responsibility for board members, administrators, and all stakeholders. Uh, yes, and here I don't have the text uh, right here, but Regarding what I was saying in the beginning, remember, I'm not a legal advisor, I'm not a lawyer, but in the text, uh, the board is also mentioned. So we don't only talk about the managers. When we say the management, we talk about the whole body. So only uh, senior, uh, senior and also board member. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. I had a question regarding incidents. Do we have a precise definition of the type of incident? What type of incident should we report in? We know it have an impact on the business, but that's all. I try to remember the article, the precise article mentioning uh, this uh, incident. I think it's Article 6. 
Okay, here you have the answer. Mrs. Uh, remember the text better than I do. Apologies for the uh, translation, but we cannot hear what the lady is saying, so we cannot translate it. So Article 6 from the Directive is completing the definition of the incident regarding an NIS-1. For NIS-1, it was a disruptive incident, so an interruption of uh, essential services. And for NIS-2, we have several uh, aspects, for example, the financial aspect, uh, data leak, data communication, and if I remember well, we also uh, moral risks. So definition is pretty broad. Thank you very much. If I don't see any more questions, I thank you for your attention today. Of course, if you would like to talk a, a bit more about this, uh, you are welcome at our stand. In any case, I wish you a good salon, a good forum, and an excellent end of day. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.